Cryptic Command. Choose two. Counter target spell, return target permanence to its owner's hand, top power oh, of the wild. Choose one. Give your minions plus one plus one. Outpost or siege. Damage. As outpost siege enters Wrath. the battle, choose, choose one. Deal three damage to a minion Cunts. or one. At the red right, upkeep. Exile one. The top card of his life. Frost on an Shape enemy. Shape of the turn. Turns. Exile play. Spawn choose frost one. on an enemy row. Boost an ally using by six. Every play of the wild hunt. Boost an ally using by eight. Thank you, Disembodied Voices, reading card descriptions, that will be all. Hi, I'm Simon from Games Deconstructed, and today I'd like to talk to you about modal card design. Choose one cards, for example. Present in very many games, and just as consciously absent from some other ones, I think that they showcase some very interesting design ideas. And by the end of this video, I hope I will have presented you with five tenets that differentiate excellent modal card designs from some of the just mediocre ones. Actually, I know I will, because I'm recording this intro after the rest of the video. Take it away, past me! The main idea behind modal cards is that power in card games is contextual. The scale of a card's effect is one thing, but how often that effect ends up mattering within a given match or meta is another one entirely. These two make up what we'll call the card's absolute power, which explains how a card that's game-winning but only usable in 10% of games might be on a similar level with cards that are generally always useful but with a minor effect. It's absolute power that determines a card's power budget, the amount of power appropriate for a card of a given cost, expressed in terms of mana, energy, or whatever your game of choice uses, and of course the added cost of spending a card or jumping through additional deck-building hoops, like with the Highlander cards of Hearthstone. Modal cards sacrifice a part of its raw effectiveness to present you with the flexibility of having access to two or more different effects, as many as you have modes. The individual effects will not be as powerful as one you would find on a card that only does one thing, but the card itself will be useful in twice, thrice, or however many situations. For example, a card that deals 3 damage to a creature for 1 mana might be evenly balanced with a modal card, also costing 1 mana, that deals 2 damage and does something entirely different from dealing damage. As we are approaching Venn Diagram territory, it's worth noting that this sum of flexibilities is extremely dependent on how much overlap there is between the two different modes. A card saying, choose one, either deal 3 damage to a creature or lower a creature's health by 3, has a lot of overlap between its two modes. There will be esoteric cases where the difference between dealing damage and lowering health is meaningful, but in the vast majority of cases both modes do exactly the same thing. The increase in universality is minimal due to the large amount of overlap. It will be strictly better than a card just saying deal 3 damage to a creature, but probably not by a lot. In cases where both of the effects are equally useful in similar ways, you don't really gain anything meaningful, and that should be reflected by the power level. That is the first tenet. Modal cards sacrifice some of their raw power for more flexibility. Staying on the topic of power, let's talk about a personal gripe of mine. That would be consolation effects. That's what I call modal cards, where there is a clear disproportion of raw power between the effects. One powerful but narrow effect, and one much smaller but near-universal one, for example. For the sake of the argument, let's present quite an extreme example that I've made up. Our two modes are either you win the game, but only if your opponent has exactly one card in their hand, one card in their graveyard, and one card in their deck, or you gain one life whenever you want. It's hard to think of an effect that's more powerful than winning the game on the spot, but the multiple hoops that you have to go through make it unreasonable to expect for it to happen too often. Gaining life 
is a useful thing in almost all situations, but gaining one of it is negligible in most situations, unless it's the one that's going to be the difference between zero and one, of course. One powerful but extremely situational effect, and one near universal one, but one that's not too exciting. I really dislike this type of design. Firstly, it incentivizes the player not to play the card, in the hope that the situation where they can use the more powerful and exciting mode will arise eventually. And if they are forced to use the quote-unquote bad one, they feel like they are losing out on a potential gain, some potential power that they have put in their deck. I really don't think that most card games should have a design that disincentivizes playing cards, that's just not fun for me. I understand that the instinct to make powerful yet situational effects is one that most card game designers have, and cards like, say, Hidetsugu's Second Right have their place, of course, but making up for their situationality by grafting another, much less fun effect on them is just not the way. Give the player other tools to realize their dreams of winning with it, rather than giving them a consolation prize. There is, of course, another place for narrow, powerful effects, and that would be tech cards. Reactive cards, built to answer narrow slices of the meta, often acting as a safety valve for when decks using a particular mechanic or tribe become too powerful. The argument also stands here. The deck-building cost of sometimes having a dead card in hand is built into the concept of tech cards. Should you want tech cards to feel more useful in their destined situations, consider allowing the players to tutor for them through other cards when necessary. The abundance of tech cards and tutors for them was why I enjoyed open beta Nilfgaard decks in Gwent so much. It's also probably why my opponents didn't enjoy playing against open beta Nilfgaard decks. So bear in mind that toolbox decks with answers to everything can become a problem comparable, if not larger, to the consolation prize mechanic. Keep the power of the modes similar. That is the second tenet. So far, we've talked about pretty dry mechanics-related stuff, so let's chill for a bit. Let's approach the topic from a more narrative slash aesthetic direction. The venerable Mark Rosewater, in his excellent article A La Mode, that I've linked in the description, explains that in designing Magic the Gathering, modal cards should feel like a single card with a variety of effects, rather than two unconnected cards crammed onto one piece of cardboard. In one way, it's a precaution against designing modes with absolutely no overlap, that are useful in starkly different situations, which seems kind of contradictory with what we've established before or in the first tenet, right? This leaves us in the often seen in card games difficult mind space of having to find a happy medium. Modes that are sufficiently different to be interesting, but also interconnected enough to establish some sense of unity between them. Both Marrow and existing MTG card designs generously provide examples of creating this sense of interconnectedness using some really neat tricks. One is basing the modes on mechanics that, even though different, appear often together. Fortify, for example, buffs either power or toughness of creatures. When each of these effects shine is starkly different, but power and toughness appear together often enough, both on cards and conversationally, that there is a sense of the two effects being two sides of the same coin. Alternatively, players will realize when your modes are taken from a larger set of abilities with a common theme. These can be colors in magic, like the four quintessentially blue abilities on Cryptic Command, which are different enough to provide interesting decision-making opportunities but recognizably belong to the blue color design space. These larger sets could also be classes in Hearthstone, archetypes in UGO, factions in Gwent. Even though Skellige can do a bunch of different things, I will recognize the link when asked to choose between three quintessentially Skellige abilities. Even alternatively, you could try establishing a narrative theme for each of the modes. This is something that Magic also does excellently. Let's take a look at a card like Frontier Siege. It reads, as Frontier Siege enters the battlefield, choose cans or dragons. Cans at the beginning of each of your main phases add green-green, 
Dragons, whenever a creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control, you may have it fight target creature you don't control. These effects are very different mechanically. In terms of when they're useful, there is also not a lot of overlap. Narratively, the second effect relates well to the idea of a siege, but the first? By presenting one of the choices as cans, the defenders, who utilize the natural space, the natural area, which happens to produce green mana, and the dragons as the attackers, uninterested in the use of that space but very keen on punching somebody's face in, they have established a narrative link between the modes, placing them within the context of the larger narrative lore conflict of the set. That's Tenet 3 make it easy for a player to grok why the two effects appear on a single card. Let me ask you a quick question. Is this a modal card? It could be presented as deal 2 damage to a player or deal 2 damage to a creature. It technically fits the definition. You can only pick one of the effects, they are probably useful in at least slightly different situations, and the modes are interconnected. They both deal damage. But they are actually similar to the overwhelming extent where we don't consciously register the card as modal, just as a card with a selection of targets. Similarly with this card, entering with a token of your choice could be expressed as multiple different discrete modes, but we tend to think of it as a single ability with multiple different flavors. Why is that? When finding similarities and differences between abilities, as we've established that's a key factor in how players judge modes, we generally uphold a set of priorities. Of course, these are, like most things in card game design, not set in stone. The most important differentiating factor is differences that have to do with game actions. Drawing cards, dealing damage, gaining health, discarding cards, tapping and untapping creatures. These direct interactions with game objects are instinctually most different from one another. Dealing damage to a creature will be judged as more different from drawing a creature than dealing fire damage will be from dealing melee damage, for example. The action is more important than its descriptors or targets. I've used Fortify as an example before, haven't I? And it seems like I ought to do some explaining on it, don't I? Fortify's modes seem to go against what I just said, right? They both just give creature stats. Giving stats is a single action, it appears in both of the card's modes, and it could very well be expressed as give a creature plus 2 plus 0 or plus 0 plus 2, sort of following the theme of the cards that we have judged as not modal. But stats in MTG also represent actions themselves. Attack allows creatures to do more damage, and toughness allows them to survive damage. Adding to one of them is mental shorthand for make the creature deal more damage or make the creature survive damage, which are saliently different enough that their difference bleeds into their representation in the form of stats, making them different enough for the card to be judged as modal. And that's 10 at 4. Don't make your modes two flavors of the same ability. If you find yourself doing that, it could probably be expressed as a single ability with a choice of targets or descriptors. 10 at 5 is both more and less complicated than the preceding 4. If you follow the others, it can either materialize on its own, or you might find yourself lacking some secret spice which will require you to look further onto the neighboring systems of your card game. 10 at 5. Modal cards should provide interesting decision-making opportunities for the player. If you've hit the sweet spot in terms of relative power between the modes, their flexibility, the modes being interconnected but significantly different, you should be left with a card that the player will want to play both modes, both sides of, at least in a vacuum. And if you're looking for further inspiration, maybe one from a game that created a whole system out of the idea of modal cards, let me introduce you to Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a co-op slash solo dungeon crawling card game in which you guide a character or group of them through a dungeon, fighting enemies, opening doors to further rooms and acquiring treasure. Your choice of cards is what allows your character to interact with the dungeon and its inhabitants. There is no distinction between hand and deck, you start with all your cards available to you. After a card is used, it will be discarded and unavailable to you until you perform the rest action. Resting returns discarded cards to your hand, but you'll also have to burn one of them, rendering it permanently unusable for the remainder of the scenario. This imposes a time limit on you as your character dies when you run out of cards. 
but apart from having to think which cards to burn and when, it also makes it important to choose which part of the card you use. And that's where modality comes in. Each card in Gloomhaven has a top side, which is generally an attack or an active ability, and a bottom side, most often associated with movement. On each turn, you'll get to use one top side and one bottom one. But these are not interchangeable, you cannot use two top sides or two bottom sides. Should you find yourself lacking useful tops or bottoms, you can use any of the top ones as a default, rather weak attack, or any of the bottom ones as a basic movement option. Some cards will have an obviously more powerful top or bottom option, but one which results in the card being burned immediately, shortening your lifespan within a dungeon without giving you the opportunity to rest. Based on that limitation of cards having differently costed modes and having to use one first and one second mode each turn, the game requires much more forethought than it would if this mechanic were to disappear. I can't count the number of turns where me or the girlfriend have considered multiple combos of different tops and bottoms, resulting in great satisfaction upon finding our preferred one. And that would be it, ladies, gentlemen and envies. I promised you a five-point drill down into what makes excellent modal card designs, and I hope I've delivered in your eyes. If you enjoyed the video and would like to see more of me or my content, feel free to press the subscribe button. And if you enjoyed the video to the point where you feel that more people should see it, the best way to let the algorithm know is to either leave a comment or press the like button. Thanks a lot for joining me, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.